How does the cross of Christ repair what's broken? Over the next several weeks, as we look into this more deeply, we'll be looking at three theories of atonement, looking for answers to these two questions. What's broken? And how does the cross fix what's broken? Each of these theories is an attempt to answer those questions, and each one is helpful in its own way. The word atonement, a very churchy word. The word atonement means to be at one with someone. If you were to write down the word atonement, you would see A-T-O-N-E-M-E-N-T. -E -E at one with someone. That's what that word is all about. When you and I make atonement, we are doing something to repair a broken relationship. The idea here is that you and I and all of humanity has a broken relationship with God. As Christians, we believe that somehow the cross and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the atonement that repairs the broken relationship with God. Atonement theories, then, are the various attempts by human beings throughout history to explain what happens on Good Friday and Easter. But human language is limited in its ability to fully describe what happens. So we use metaphors. And so these atonement theories are metaphors that increase our faith and our understanding and through and increase our power, the power in our lives through them. As we come to understand more fully, to realize more deeply, more knowingly, who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished through his death and through his resurrection. You see here in the chancel area several crucifixes. I borrowed this one from Santa Maria del Mar. There are wonderful brothers and sisters, partners in the ministry that we share together. And I called Father Al and I said, Father Al, we don't have a crucifix in our church. It's not something us Lutherans are used to looking at very often. And so can we borrow one? And he said, absolutely. So I went and picked that one up. These others are some that Bob and I have. And so we have these here as a, a focal point, a way of us to look at this cross and to see Jesus, to see Jesus there. When we get too comfortable and we expect to see the empty cross all the time, we might not fully grasp that on that Good Friday, on that day, a man, a person, died. So during this season of Lent, we want to keep that image close as we go towards our journey of making sense of this cross. When I was in a class in seminary where we were unpacking these three main atonement theories, Many of us, me included, were surprised to learn that there was more than one way to understand the cross. And so as we got into this and as we began to ask questions about this, each one had a strong biblical foundation. Each one makes sense as you look at the cross and its understanding. And so we became more and more frustrated. We said to the professor, who was actually president of the seminary, Dr. Reese, we said, Dr. Reese, just tell us which one is the right one. And he said, that's not the point. It's not the point to know which one is the right one. The point is, is that each one gives us a different lens and tells us a little more about this action of Jesus on the cross. Now, you might start to feel like that over the next several weeks. Well, which one is right, okay? I'm getting so confused. I don't know which one is right. 
Remember that we are less about finding the right one and more about engaging with the events of Good Friday and Easter, with engaging with what happened on that day and God's power over death on Easter Day, and finding out how we experience the cross in our lives today. Now, I've said several times that there are multiple atonement theories, three, in fact. The first one was developed uh, almost 2,000 years ago. It came out of the church's understanding closer to the events of Christ's death and resurrection. It's become known as the classic, the classic view. Here we'll describe it as ransom and victory, the key, key words that will help us unpack that. The second theory was developed in the Middle Ages by a theologian named Anselm, who picked up on the themes of the Bible, substitution, satisfaction, and sacrifice. Substitution, satisfaction, sacrifice. Key words in his uh, understanding of atonement. And the third theory is also developed in the Middle Ages, another theologian's reaction to Anselm's uh, theory, and it focuses more on Jesus as uh, the example that we are to follow. Each is different. This week our focus is on ransom and victory, in which sin and human brokenness are considered to be in bondage. Christ comes to us, ransoms us from bondage. Christ then is the victor over the bondage. It's not only victory over our daily struggle with sin and the devil, it's victory over death itself. Now it's at this point that we could go further into the mumbo jumbo of theology. But rather than do that, I want to tell you a story. See, I have to be careful. I like to use my hands to it. Stay there. Be nice. Tell you a story. It's not my story. It's a story written by C.S. Lewis in the late 1940s. It's actually a children's story. But I don't know. When you read it, it's kind of scary. It's the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Maybe you had a chance to read that as a child growing up. Maybe you saw the movie. But it's a wonderful Tell. And so I tell you this story today. It starts in 1940 during World War II when four siblings, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, are evacuated as citizens, civilians in Britain during World War II. They are sent away to London by their parents to live with Professor Kirk, who lives in a country house in the English countryside. Professor was not used to having children around, and so he pretty much ignored their activities in the house. Just said, be quiet, I got work to do, you're on your own. So while the four children were exploring the house, Lucy, the youngest, looks into a wardrobe and discovers there in the wardrobe a doorway to a magical world named Narnia. There she meets a fawn. That's a half-human and a half-goat. And this fawn invites her to his home for tea. And while she is there having tea with him, the fawn discloses to her that, I was going to turn you in to our queen, but I've changed my mind. And so, Lucy is thankful to that, and the fawn helps her find her way back to the lamppost so that she can re-enter the house through the same wardrobe. Now, she begins to tell her children, her sisters and brother, her sister and brothers, guess where I've been? <laughs> and of course, none of them are believing of her, and so they, what, don't, what are you talking about, Lucy? So she describes what she sees. And Edmund, her next older brother, he gets a bit curious. And so he goes out into the wardrobe himself, and he wants to figure out what Lucy's seen that he hasn't seen. And so as he goes in through the wardrobe and out to the lamppost, this very beautiful woman, all dressed in white, shows up. She looks so cool to him. He's first taken aback by her. But she speaks to him in soft and gentle words, and she extends 
used to him a cup, something to drink. And so he drinks from this cup, and in so doing, he becomes enchanted by her spell. He, she takes him to her place, to the castle. And she, then she, she entertains him, and as she talks about with him, she says to him, if you will go back to your siblings and bring them here, I will make you in charge of them. They will worship you. You will be the ruler. You will be in charge. Well, of course, you know, the little brother? Absolutely, I'm all for that. So he finds his way back through the wardrobe. He shows up back in the house and, and he begins to support Lucy. Now, he doesn't tell anybody that he's actually been to Narnia. But he supports Lucy in her tale of Narnia, this beautiful place. And he says, well, I think we should go there. And so all four of the siblings go through the wardrobe. Then they meet the beavers. And the beavers invite them to their home. And in visiting with the beavers, the beavers tell them of this prophecy. They tell them of this ruler of Narnia who is such a tyrant, who is so mean and all this dark winter that has come upon the land and the power that she has, this, this queen. And as she talks, Lucy and Edmund began to realize this is the white witch, the one that Mr. Fawn mentioned to Lucy. Lucy and the one that Edmund had visited. Edmund then gets nervous. The beavers tell the children that of this prophecy where two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve will come and sit upon the throne. And in so doing, they will overcome this evil queen, this white witch, and they will restore peace and beauty to the land. They tell the children of this king of Narnia, who has been asleep, who's been away, the lion, Anza. And so Edmund gets concerned. He runs away. He goes to tell the white witch what is happening. The children become concerned. They don't know where he, where he is. The beavers are concerned. So they go to find this lion. And they tell the lion what has happened to Edmund. And the lion, and, and the lion gathers his army and they, they go in search of him. But as they go in search of him, the white witch approaches and says, the lion, and says to him, I claim this child. I will take his life for being a traitor to me. I am queen. And Anselm bargains with the white witch and offers himself in the place of Edmund. The white witch, of course, thinks this through. And here's the king of Narnia, the real king, giving himself up for this child. She sees nothing but good in that action. And so she accepts this bargain as Anselm gave himself up. She takes him to the stone table. She ties him down and she kills him. The next morning, Anselm is set free. He is brought back to life. And as the children gather around him, this time just Susan and Lucy, the two women, two young girls, are waiting on him as he dies. He tells them that he has the deeper power that will overcome the evil because of his innocence. I hope that as I told this story, that you made the connection to Jesus on the cross. To the one mediator between us and God, who gave of himself the innocent one, taking upon himself the sins of humanity, offering himself up to death in our place. 
Jesus is the victor of all the evil that surrounds us. Jesus is the victor of the sinfulness and the brokenness that binds us. You see, that's what it means when we say that we have been ransomed. An innocent person went forward in our place to take on the punishment that we deserved and who died for us. I'd like to read to you from Romans chapter 5 how Paul describes this action. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. Jesus ransomed himself for us. And in his death, obtain the victory over it all. And so, my sisters and brothers, our brokenness and all of our inevitable deaths do not have the last word. Jesus does. You say that. Jesus, Jesus does. does. Our failures don't have the last word. Jesus does. Our mistakes don't have the last word. Jesus, Jesus does. Our blunders, our pain, our bad deeds, our addictions, our fear doesn't have the last word. Jesus, Jesus does. 